The events I'm about to describe are completely true and took place in early 1987. A little backstory. I grew up in a small town in the southeast corner of Idaho. The town's population at the time was about 4,500 people and it was nestled next to a Native American reservation. Most calls for police assistance came from one of the few bars in town where the natives and rednecks would have one too many and would often end up squaring off with each other. The rest of the time it was responding to noise complaints, juvenile delinquents, and domestic disputes. My father was a medical officer for the local county jail. My uncle, on my mother's side, who I will call Rich, lived nearby and recently became engaged to his longtime girlfriend, who I will refer to as Sharon. Sharon was an attractive tall blonde and worked as a night shift clerk for a local convenience store called the Mini Barn. It was named that due to its appearance of resembling an old school farmer's barn. It sat in the northwest corner of the town, next to an old highway, once used as access to the nearby towns, before Interstate 15 was completed. Shortly after their engagement was announced, Uncle Rich and Sharon would visit our home on a regular basis. I can't remember the exact day, but I do remember it was either late January or early February when Rich and Sharon arrived a bit later than they normally would. Usually they would arrive in the late morning or early afternoon. However, this time they arrived after the sun had set and were braving a pretty serious snowstorm. My parents were shocked by the visit and invited them in and they began to talk. What I found odd about this was that they would normally talk in the front room. This time they were talking in the kitchen and it was obvious that they were trying to keep their voices down, which didn't work as well as they thought. I didn't think much about it until my uncle said something that perked up my curiosity and made me zero in on the conversation in progress. I can very clearly remember hearing my uncle ask my dad, Hey, do you think you could call in a favor with the sheriff's office to request some extra patrols at that time? It would really make us both feel better. Now, my father was and is the kind of guy who doesn't like being asked for favors. He responded with, Well, I can ask, but the area is kind of a gray zone. Neither the city police nor the sheriff's office are sure who has jurisdiction. Since nothing really happens there, it's never been debated and no official ruling has been made. They simply share it. My dad continued, Have you looked into possibly applying for a concealed weapons permit? Because I had not paid attention to the first part of the conversation, I assumed it had something to do with my Uncle Rich, but what was said next made me realize it was actually about Sharon. If this guy is scaring you that bad, you need something to protect yourself, Sharon. Now Sharon was soft-spoken and had a very shy personality, so I knew my father's recommendation of carrying a firearm would go over like a fart in church. Oh no, she exclaimed. Guns scare me. I would be too afraid I would shoot myself on accident or something. All right, I'll do what I can, but I can't make any promises, my dad said. He then took a deep breath before continuing. Can you give me a description of the guy who was harassing you? He is huge, Sharon said with more emotion than I had ever heard come out of her previously. He has to be about 6'4 or 6'5 and he has long stringy hair. Listening to her describe the man made me think that she was lying, not because she was known for lying, but because it was such a small town, and if anyone looked like Andre the Giant, he would stick out like a sore thumb. Uncle Rich was almost six foot four and in very good physical condition, so for Sharon to describe this guy as massive was a hard sell. When was the last time he was in the store? My dad asked. I could tell by the change in my dad's tone and demeanor. He didn't believe her either, or at the very least, he believed that she was highly exaggerating the man's description. Well, he hasn't actually come into the store for about two weeks now, she said. Sharon must have sensed my dad's reservations because she continued very quickly. What's happening now is that he's pulling up to the store in his truck. He sits there with the engine on and his lights turned off. I can't see into the truck, but I know he's there watching me. Just before my dad could respond, my mother noticed me eavesdropping on the conversation and yelled at me to mind my own business. I ran back to my room and I heard nothing else from them the entire evening. I never heard if the police actually did any patrols or if my dad ever actually notified them about the issue. About three weeks after that conversation occurred, 
They were at a family get-together where Uncle Rich and Sharon were in attendance. Sharon announced that she had left her job and that she and Uncle Rich were moving back to Utah to prep for their upcoming wedding. Later, I overheard my dad ask about any further issues with the man they had discussed. Due to all the noise, I was unable to hear the whole answer, but I did hear something about a customer witnessing someone matching the man's description peering through a window at Sharon. When confronted, the large man jumped into his truck which was parked behind the store and sped off down the old highway. I heard Sharon state that she was glad to be done with the whole situation. The next time we would see Sharon and Rich would be at their wedding four months later. What took place over that time would put all southeastern Idaho in a state of constant fear. About a week after Sharon quit the mini barn, on February 28th, just a little after midnight, some friends of the new night shift clerk walked into the store to check on her and to buy a few things. As they approached the store, they saw a pickup truck speeding out of the parking lot. While they couldn't see the face of the driver, they were able to make out that he had long hair. When they entered the store, the clerk, who I will call Susie, was nowhere to be found. Her purse was behind the counter along with her keys and her car was still in the parking lot. Police were contacted and a search began immediately. At around 7 a.m., seven hours after she went missing, a motorist who was driving past some old dumpsters on a back road found Susie's body. She had been shot multiple times and was left for dead. An autopsy later revealed that the gunshots were not immediately fatal. Susie had laid there for hours in pain and felt her life slipping away. Just under three weeks later, on March 17th, at a convenience store 28 miles south, a mail clerk was found in the walk-in cooler. He had been shot multiple times and was suffering from severe hypothermia, but he was still alive. Unfortunately, he would eventually succumb to his injuries, but was able to give a description of the man who shot him before his life ended. The description was nearly identical to the one that Sharon had given of the man who was harassing her. The killer would strike again only two days later in the same town, abducting a special education school teacher from the parking lot of a grocery store. She had been sexually assaulted and was shot nine times. This time, however, a nearby farmhand heard the shots and went to investigate. He saw a blue van, later identified as the victim's van, fleeing the scene, and behind the wheel was his cousin, who he identified as Paul Ezra Rhodes. Rhodes was a known meth addict and had been in trouble his whole life. He was known to law enforcement, who went to his mother's house to question him. Upon arriving at the house, his mother answered the door and stated that she had not seen Paul in several days and he had taken her car. He was later arrested at a casino in Wells, Nevada after crashing his mother's car and running from the scene. A trucker who witnessed the accident saw Rhodes drop something on the ground as he fled. Police arrived and found the item to be a 38 caliber revolver. Forensic testing later determined it to be the gun used to murder all three of the victims. This effectively tied Rhodes to the crimes and officially labeled him as a serial killer. Rhodes was also found to be in possession of personal items belonging to each of the victims. He confessed to detectives that he was behind the murders and was quickly expedited back to Idaho to stand trial. Upon arriving back in my town, he was booked into the county jail on the day of my 10th birthday. My dad was assigned to complete his medical intake. I asked my dad what Rhodes was like, fully expecting to hear of a snarling beast who was foaming at the mouth. What my dad told me shocked and confused me. My dad said that Rhodes was extremely polite and courteous. He described Rhodes as someone who said, please and thank you. He never had to be asked twice to do something. He even had the corrections officers and medical staff laughing at times. I couldn't believe that. I told myself my dad was lying to stop me from being scared. He was found guilty and sentenced to death for the murder of Susie the night clerk. He was then ready to be transferred to the next county over to stand trial for the murders that happened there. The day Rhodes was said to be transferred was a long day 
my grandmother on my mom's side had been diagnosed with cancer and wasn't doing too well. We were afraid that we would lose her at any minute. My mom had taken my brothers to Utah to be with her family. I had to stay back because I was in fourth grade and was doing the standardized testing that week and my parents didn't want me to miss it. The plan was for my dad to pick me up from school early and then make the drive to Utah to rendezvous with my mom and brothers. But instead of leaving for Utah, he took me to the county jail. He said he had something important to do before we left and assured me that it wouldn't take too long. He took me to a room that looked like some kind of waiting area in a long hallway. He told me that he would be back soon. I waited there for about 15 minutes when I heard a door at the far end of the hallway open and close. It was followed by several male voices, one of which I recognized as my dad's. The voices were coming down the hall and I figured that he was done and was simply saying goodbye to his co-workers. I hopped up and waited for my dad to arrive. What happened next is something that I'll never forget. I saw two sheriff deputies round the corner at the far end. A few seconds later, they were followed by a large man in an orange jumpsuit. He was handcuffed in the front and was shackled to a chain belt around his waist. His ankles were cuffed and bound by a chain that made a rattling sound as he shuffled forward. He had long hair and really bad acne. Behind him were two more officers, followed by my dad and a detective. It took me all but two seconds to grasp what and who I was looking at. I heard the deputies talking to Rhodes and him responding with simple yes and no's. My heart was racing as I tried to look away, but I couldn't. Suddenly, both Rhodes and the police noticed that I was standing there. My dad realized what was happening. He quickly and sternly told me to sit down and not to speak. I tried to say okay, but all I could muster was a very simple head nod. I don't know why I did, but I looked back at Rhodes and realized that he was smiling at me. He turned to my dad and asked, Is that your son? I felt my heart sink into my chest and I became paralyzed with fear. My dad smiled as he approached me and responded with, Yeah, he's my third oldest. Rhodes looked back at me and with a smile on his face, raised his hand and gave me a small wave. Hi there, young man. Out of instinct only, I waved back and quickly moved back to where I was before. I sat down and stared directly at the ground. I was officially terrified and felt like I was going to vomit. They left the room a few minutes later. Eventually my dad and the detective came back. I thought for sure my dad was going to be mad at me and I prepped for an ass chewing. Instead they sat down next to me and asked if I was okay. I told him I was, even though I wasn't, but I didn't want to look like a coward. I rode the entire two hour trip to Utah in silence, except for the promise I made to my dad that I would never tell my mother what happened. Dad told me, years later, they weren't even supposed to take that route. However, just minutes before he was about to leave, a threat they considered to be credible on Rhodes' life was called into the police station. A ton of media was set up outside the door they were supposed to exit. With the media circus in full effect, it was presenting a strategic nightmare for law enforcement. They decided at the last minute to take him down that particular hallway where I was sitting. They would issue Rhodes a bulletproof vest, then take him out the side door quickly to a waiting unmarked transport vehicle. The regular transport van was used as a decoy to ensure that the plan was carried out safely and securely without anyone being the wiser. It was pure coincidence that my encounter with him took place and until now, I have never told anyone about this experience. In the next county, Rhodes took a plea deal for the murder of the male convenience store clerk and received a life sentence. He pled not guilty for the school teacher's murder and went to trial. He was later found guilty and received a second death sentence. Rumor has it that Rhodes told detectives the first clerk murdered was not the intended target. Instead, he wanted the stubborn blonde bitch that usually works that shift. The only blonde that has ever worked at the mini barn 
was my Aunt Sharon. I cannot confirm this, but if true, it would fit the timeline and verify that he was the man that my aunt was talking about that night. But Sharon has never confirmed that the man she saw was Rhodes. On May 18th, 2011, Rhodes was led into the death chamber at Boise State Penitentiary at 8.30 a.m. and was strapped to a gurney. He was then executed by lethal injection and was pronounced dead at 9.15 a.m. In his final statement, he admitted to and apologized for the death of the school teacher. However, he maintained his innocence of the other two murders. He then turned to the warden and executioner and told them that he forgave them for what they were about to do. I have left out my aunt and uncle's real names and also the names of the victims for privacy reasons. To this day, I'm not sure if my aunt Sharon realizes just how close she came to being a victim of this man's murder spree. I have lost touch with that side of the family since my parents' divorce and will probably never see them again. I wouldn't ask them even if I did. My heart goes out to the families of the victims who are left with a burden of loss. For anyone who doesn't believe me or is interested in learning more about Rhodes and his crimes, you can simply Google search his name and find multiple websites detailing his life and crimes. There's also a show on Investigation Discovery called Ice Cold Killers that has an episode called Blizzard of Bullets, which is specifically about Rhodes. I will leave you with this last piece of knowledge. There's an infamous picture which I have attached. It's of Rhodes being led into court. In this picture, he is surrounded by law enforcement and court personnel. One of the men is the detective who witnessed my encounter. Another is the medical officer, who just so happens to be my father.